All right, so it's wonderful to meet you. My name is Michael Allen. Hopefully everything runs very smooth this training. And so we're, let's talk about that first step that we're going to use in order to print these objects. Now, we know that in a school, we very much want to teach these students how to utilize this and kind of move into that manufacturing idea. So we get a prototype, we get a design, and we get a manufacturer. So what we're looking at for the first step is that design phase. So we want to go through the design iteration process. We want to be able to create objects and then them off, obviously, is kind of the goal. And what we're looking for is a couple programs that are going to get us there. So one, all of these that we recommend are free for educators or students, and they're also kind of scaled and easier to use. So the first one that we recommend use with is Tinkercad. And now it's, that's completely web-based. They can work on your Chromebooks. And then you can utilize any of that kind of information. And it's basically a drag and drop shapes. So you're going to have a big work plane. And you're going to be able to pull the shapes from the side and put it into the build space and combine a whole bunch of different shapes into a larger object. And so that was and CAD. So next, the other one that I'd like to mention is another CAD program that's completely web-based to kind of adhere to the Chromebooks that are going through our schools right now, how we've kind of moved to that. And it's going to be Onshape. And so that's O-N-S-H-A-P-E. And that one's free and easy to sign up for just with an email. But it's going to be much more robust. There's a lot more options inside of it. And there's going to be tools that you can utilize, and it's much more like a traditional CAD program. So traditional integrated design is where you have a sketch plane, you create a single sketch, and then you make that three-dimensional. And so that's really what you're kind of working towards for most of us. Have you guys had any experience in CAD programs? Uh, I have not. Okay. No, we have. Sure. So I would recommend starting in Tinkercad and kind of messing around in that area will kind of bring you into what's happening in that industry. And it'll get you used to like camera controls and how to combine things and group them all together. And so there's a ton of tutorials online that's included when you join into Tinkercad that are great for the range of Okay. So the one thing we're looking for out of that design phase is a file. Now that file is going to be a .stl. And so what that stands for is a standard triangle language. And it basically means that whatever shape you had made in that design program is then going to be expressed in triangles in this file type. And that's just going to be a mesh of triangles that connect from vertices and edges to create the object. And that's the first thing. That one's pretty easy. Usually there's an export button somewhere on the screen, just like Tinkercad has it. Uh, sometimes it's in like file and export. So that's kind of the general setup there for getting that STL file, which is crucial to 3D print. So the second step that we're going to go over is going to be necessary to have a computer to install programs on. Is that possible for you guys? A what? Desktops? Well, some PC that you can install a program on. Yes. Do the Chromebooks count? The Chromebooks cannot install programs themselves. We've, I've got, we've got a PC we can load, yes. Awesome. So we're going to need to do that. And also within your toolkit, you should have had a small USB like this. It has a little tiny USB. It's going to have a small SD card, a micro SD card in the back of it. I can swap you for it. Just like this. Okay, found it. Yep, sweet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug that into our PC, wherever it may be. And we can kind of go over the, uh, the details about this here a slicer. So this program that we're about to utilize is a 3D slicing program. And it takes that STL file or that mesh of triangles and it cuts it into a whole bunch of different layers so that the printer is going to understand it. So this printer is Chinese and the STL file would be English to it. So it's not going to get along well and we need to convert it to make sure it understands. Okay. Okay, so if we plug that in, we should see a couple different folders on our SD card itself. So I'm going to share my screen from kind of this point on to help you install, and then I'll come back and work through with this process. So I'm going to click share screen here. And once you install Cura, it should bring up this screen. So let me show you the folder it's in. 
So it should be on the USB drive and then it should be located in the Cura folder. Got it. Double click on that and you can double click on the application file here. Okay. All right, and it's gonna go through its install process. It's just gonna kind of do the introductory thing like the user license agreement, and then it's just going to be click, click, and then when it hits that new machine wizard or it asks you to select a printer, um, just let me know. We'll go through it. Okay, English. Okay, it's asking what kind of machine do I have? Fantastic. So this is the same one I'm on. It's going to look a lot like this, I would assume. Yes. And so we're going to select other for the first value. Okay. And then we're going to choose Mendel or M-E-N-D-E-L. So it's about halfway down the list. All right. And click next one more time and finish. Cure is now ready to be used. Yep. So this is going to be a whole new window that kind of has the blue build space, which represents the build space on your printer. So all of the settings inside of this is going to determine how your printer acts, how it prints, and also how the model ends up being. So this decides a lot for it, and it is a necessary step. And so this is going to convert that STL file to a G code. And G code is the same information that a CNC machine takes for the toolpath to follow. So it's essentially just the head of the printer here, which path to follow in order to create the three-dimensional object. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna click here in this top left-hand corner and click on machine and choose machine settings. Okay. So we just need to verify a couple of things. We're gonna change a few of these values, the width, depth, and height, and then this checkbox. So let's go ahead with the width. It'll be 125 millimeters. Now that's right around five inches. Okay. And then the maximum depth will be 150. Got it. And finally, the height is 100. So we're looking at a five by six by four inch build area. And this is actually pretty average for current printers that are out there that are using the same type of desktop emulation. So the idea is that, you know, if you do have a small build space, it is harder to put a whole bunch of things on it but printing large objects takes considerable amount of time and considerable amount of material. And so a lot of the time, I like to recommend that students, if they're printing on these, to keep their models small and closer to under an hour in order to get that model to print successfully. Um, a lot of the time, uh, students will print a very, very large model or create a very large model um, as they don't have the units set in, in that same area and the print will have to be scaled in order to fit directly. Yeah, it'll definitely have to be scaled to fit mm -hmm. All righty, so let's go ahead and unclick the heated bed. Okay. And then finally, we can change the machine name to just the NWA 3D A5. NWA 3D A5. So the A5 is the type of printer. A5. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then I'm gonna click OK and OK on the next screen, and then we should be good. So now all we have to do is change these settings on the left-hand side, which determine what our print will look like. So, there's quite a few options, so I'm going to go through these. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me, ask me another question, um, or kind of ask me to re-explain it. That would be perfectly fine. Um, so we're going to start from the top and go down to the bottom. And so we're going to start right here at layer height. Now, layer height is going to be our biggest determinant of quality or how nice it will look. This is considered to be the resolution, as some people place it, or how close each layer of plastic is laid down. So the closer the plastic, the nicer the object's going to look. 
So we use any value from 0 0.1 millimeters to 0 0.3 millimeters. 0 0.3 will be that coarse quality and 0 0.1 will be the fine quality. So I'm gonna leave mine at 0 0.2. I like the mid range. It prints in a decent amount of time and it also still looks well. So next what we're gonna have is shell thickness. And shell thickness determines the width of the outside wall of our model. So whenever the walls are printed, the printing travels one time around, say, the circumference of it, and that one time around is going to lay down the same amount of the size of the nozzle. So our nozzles are 0.4 millimeters, so every time that nozzle goes around one circumference, it'll lay down 0.4 millimeters of plastic. And that happens every single time it goes around. So if we want two thicknesses to our walls, we would want 0.8 as our value. So that's what we're going to change this one to. You may notice that the text box goes yellow after you have typed in 0 0.8 because our nozzle size down at the bottom isn't set to 0 0.4. Now, the nozzle size is a hardware, piece of hardware on the printer itself, and you have to change it in order to change this value. So we want to make sure that this is set to 0 0.4 and it stays that way and then you should see that box go white because it's happy. Okay. Yeah. We'll see a little bit more of this whenever we work with our model when we put one in here. So next we have enable retraction and it's a, just a checkbox and we wanna leave it checked. This helps to make sure that the print doesn't string or plastic doesn't kind of look like spider webs happening all over it. Basically what it's doing is while it's printing, it pulls the filament back a little bit so the printer head doesn't drool the plastic out. All right, now the bottom and top thickness is the exact same thing as the shell thickness, but it determines the top and bottom of the model instead of the perpendicular walls. So we're going to change that to 0 0.8. So that would make the thickness for all of our walls the same. And that's just how I prefer it. So if we wanted to go up the thickness in every single wall, we would increase this value by 0.4, so we'd look, look at 1.2 millimeters for three shells. All right, next we're going to have fill density. And this determines how durable our object is going to be. So this is the area in between the model, the empty space that's filled in to support the walls in the top and bottom. So I'm going to leave it at 20, and we'll take a look at it when we look at the model. Next, we're going to have print speed. And print speed is 50 millimeters per second. This is going to be the fastest we want to travel for our print. You can travel slower in order to increase quality. If you travel faster, it's possible that your model may end up with defects in some areas or it could knock it off the build area. So 50 is about the maximum you're going to want to go. Now, if you slow it down to 35, it can improve the quality of things like spears or very hard curves because it it's, has more time to travel. Next, we're going to have the printing temperature. And we're going to change this value to 220 degrees Celsius. This is our preferred printing value because the plastic that we use has an extra composite in it that makes it a little bit flexible. So it requires more heat to be effectively liquefied. So we're going to leave it at 10. It'll work well there. And then we're going to choose our support type. Now this is something that Kira generates itself. And this is for things such as overhangs. So areas that don't have support underneath them or don't have a part of a model underneath. So that's going to mean like if you have a robot and has an arm standing out and kind of holding air it's going to need something to print up to that midair arm. So it's basically going to construct scaffolding for our object and that's going to happen all over the object so it can three-dimensionally and those are removable later. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to change that. We're going to change that to everywhere for now just to make sure that any models we do select will be able to print successfully with supports everywhere. 
as you get more comfortable with kind of seeing how supports work and the orientations of print and which is better, you may not have to have that value as often. So next we have platform adhesion type and it does exactly what it says. It helps to adhere things to the platform. So it's going to help keep those models or those prints stuck to the build area to make sure that they don't knock over or fall off. So this is best used if there's a small surface area to your object. So say you're trying to print a pencil or a pen and you stand it upright, it's going to have a very small surface area and in that case, I would want to put a brim on it. Now that's going to kind of create a suction cup effect and provide an extra surface area around the object so that it can hold itself up. These are also easily broken off after the print is finished. We're gonna leave that on none now because we shouldn't need any for the model we're gonna use. And you can decide on that value if you do have a small surface area. So next, we're gonna change the filament diameter to 1.75. That value can also be seen on your plastic itself, on the sticker it has. Now the sticker should say PLA, which is polylactic acid, and it's also a biodegradable and made from cornstarch. So it's a nice plastic, it's easy to use, and it's also kind of smells like pancakes when you print it. So there is no harmful fumes, it's not going to cause any problems in your classroom, and it should work well. So next we have flow percentage. We're going to change this value. This basically determines how much plastic is output. So if I increase this by 5%, it's going to put out 5% extra plastic. It's as simple as that one is. Um, I don't usually change that value. It's not something you typically have to have. All right, so that's all of our values that we want to change to make our base model. And this is kind of like the golden standard that you would come back to if something's going wrong with maybe Curo or your model, or you can't seem to get it print right, this would be what you want to come to. Now, all of these values are available to you in case you forget them in any way. That's just in the Curo folder. The same one we saw the file from, there is a Curo settings.png, and it's going to have all the settings that we just covered. Okay. So that's just for your resources. And next, what we're going to do is we're going to load a model in here and take a look at what this program actually does for us. So I'm going to click here on the load environment. You guys probably have a little robot on there already. He is a good example. We can use him if you would like. There is also a dice available on your SD card if you would like to load that in. So I click load and navigate to the SD card. And inside the SD card there is an STL files folder. And so that's the type of file we wanted from our design process. I'm going to double click on that folder, and then I'm going to select the six-sided dice. So when I finally click open on that, it should pop up that dice in the middle of my build area. Okay. Okay. Now this is the environment that we can manipulate with. We can move this to all the corners. We can put it wherever we would like, but if it goes gray like so, it means it is not capable of being printed. This is either because it's outside of boundaries or it's intersecting with another object, and you need to make sure that it's yellow before it'll print. So I kind of moved mine around, it's a little bit weird, so I'm gonna put it back in the middle, and I can do that by right-clicking on the object. By right-clicking and select Center on Platform, it'll go pop right to the middle. Now also in that right click menu, you have a delete object and multiply object in case you want to increase or delete objects. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So you can put as many models on the build space as you can fit, just to remember that the time requirement is going to go up heavily. So if we take a look in the top left hand corner, you'll notice that this cube itself takes about 14 minutes. Now if I multiply it to about five or six of them, you'll notice that the time increases by so now it's an hour and 24 minutes to print six dice. So that's the feasibility of a 3D printer. They seem quick, but it does take a while in some regards, especially for a school day. So I'm going to go back to them. I'm just going to delete each of these just by right click. Excellent. 
So a little bit about camera control, so you can move it around a little more. If you right click, it should rotate it for you. So I'm right clicking and dragging. If I hold the shift key and right click, it'll pan and go side to side. And then you can zoom in and out with a scroll wheel or a trackpad is possible. And that's just gonna be the same as we think in and out. Excellent, so that's just a little bit more about the environment. Now let's take a look at these tools that we have in here as well. So we're gonna have the rotate and scale tool, which are very important to make sure everything prints right. So if you left click on the object, you'll notice that these three boxes in the bottom up. And so that's going to allow us to move it and rotate it or orient the, pro the project we're printing in the correct orientation. So what I mean by orientation is if you had that robot and you had decided to, that robot with the arm we were talking about with the scaffolding and the robot arms were not supported, maybe a good way to fix that would be to lay him flat, which is more possible. It would make smaller supports and it would be easier to print them. So that's some things that you could consider when you're printing. What's the best way to print this model? Yep, so you could lay him flat, you can stand him up. There's all sorts of different ways that you could orient a model. You could put him on his head if you wanted to. Print, but it would take longer. Yeah. So a lot of the time, the time consider, excuse me, that was redundant. The time consideration or the time constraint is going to be something that you want to look at pretty consistently. Because um, the time can drastically increase. So if I, of course, scale this object with our tool down here, and these are percentages, so I can change this to two, it's gonna be 200% the size. And my time's gonna to increase to one hour and eight minutes, just it being twice the size. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of things to kind of take into consideration. So if a student does have a much too large model, you know, they're trying to print a dice that's this size, and you're like, we, we're not gonna do that. You can always come back in here and scale this value down smaller, so 0 0.5, it'll be half the size was originally. So this allows you to kind of change the time frame of when a model will be printed. So I'm going to change that back to one. So you also have a reset value here and a two max or to maximum build volume. So it would blow up the cube as big as it can get it. So next we're going to have the rotate and this is just the three axes pop up. So we have a green, a yellow, and a red circle. And by grabbing one of those circles, it's going to rotate it on that axis. And so we can choose to do that. Yep, so it's just going to be the X, Y, Z. So the printer considers this to be X, this to be Y, and then, of course, back to be Z. All right, so that's about all of it, except one other thing that I'm going to show you that's very important to me, and this is pretty much the view I always look in. Now, if we click here in the top right-hand corner, you'll notice it's called something called view mode. And this allows us to change how we're looking at the object. So click on view mode and go down to layers. Now, your robot probably changed colors. So now he's in assortment, kind of like this. And so the assortment of colors is pretty easy to explain. So I'm going to look at the top of this just to show you. Now, here we have in red is the outside perimeter or our first shell. The green is the inside perimeter or the second shell. The dark blue lines is how the print head is going to move. The yellow is infill or top and bottom. And then if you cut into the object like so, you'll notice that it has a lattice structure on the inside. So I cut into it by the slider here on the right-hand side. Now this lattice structure is going to be that durability I was talking about earlier. So if we come back over to the fill density and I were to change this value to 30 this time, watch the interior of the model. It'll generate it in a second. So it's going to be much stronger in this orient or this type because it has 30% infill instead of 20. So this cube itself, since it's a square or it's a cube, excuse me, 
is going to have a variable shape by itself. So generally, a field density of 10% is more than happy enough for it. So much less, now that's going to decrease our time and decrease the material we use. So if we want to take a look at the shell thickness real quick, I zoom in a little bit here to kind of look at this green wall. And I'm going to increase this value. I'm going to double it and watch the green wall. You'll notice that it got considerably thicker. And so now we have a thicker outside wall and interior so that it allows us to kind of use less inside structure, but we have thicker durable walls. So it's harder to park it, really. So I'm going to change that back to 0 0.8 increase the time a little bit, because I like two walls typically. Now if I increase the layer height, that's going to increase the amount of layers that we see here. So if we kind of look at the time, you'll notice that it is cut into XY layers. So that's how the printer is actually going to see it. It's going to print each individual layer by it. So the last thing I want to check on is the very first layer to make sure that it's on the build area. So if you look here, I have it all the way down at one. And it does look like it's sitting on the build plate, so it should be good when we print it. So I feel happy about it. We have sliced it, we've prepared it. And now we can go ahead and click File and Save G Code. So I had mentioned that file type a little bit earlier. That's going to be our Chinese that the printers understand, and the STL was the English that we understand. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to go ahead and save it just on my regular SD card. So I'm just going to save it in the file and click save. Now that SD card is what goes inside of our printer. So if you need to see that again, I went ahead and did file, save G code, and then click save. Just inside of the USB drive, so it's sitting there now. And we can close Cura. We're finished with it at this point. So all of your values that you set in there will save for your account. Now, if a different student came and logged in or a different teacher came and logged in, you would have to reset those. So I'm going to eject my drive now. Now, it's redundant in this day and age to say eject your drive, but due to the fact that if it doesn't save the G code completely, the printer will stop in the middle of it and just sit there. And it's gonna be heated up and it's just gonna stay there because it didn't have something to tell it what to do. It never got to, hey, stop printing. So we wanna make sure that, that it does finish. So we do that by clicking, right clicking on the object, excuse me, on the SD card and clicking eject. If it's not ready, it'll tell us there. I'm gonna unplug it now. Now I'm gonna come back to the screen over here. Do you guys have any questions on Cura before we kind of move into the next steps and the next kind of phases into that troubleshoot? Mm -hmm. yeah, All right. So we have our little USBs, and in the back of it, there is an SD card. Little SD card out. And we're going to place that inside of our printer. So on our printer, if we look at it, we're going to have this yellow kind of faceplate here and a button and a screen. Now, if we look directly below the button at the base of the printer, we should be able to see a small slot for the SD card. Wow. And so that should just click into place like kind of every other SD card slot. It has a little spring in it. Should be pretty simple to plug in there. That was step three. So we had done, the first step was design or STL. Second was that slice or prepare it for the printer. And then third was transfer it to the printer, which we just did. And finally, the last option that we would need to do is just print the object. Now, since our printers have gone through shipping, they've gone through FedEx, we have no idea what's happened to them, even from Fayetteville to Allen. So what we're going to need to do is we're gonna check out the printer. We're gonna go over kind of those basic troubleshooting steps. So normally we'd be ready to print, but we want to, we want to make sure that we have it set up correctly. So I'm going to plug my printer in just from here on the side. You'll notice that there is, here, let me swap cameras for you. You can view the printer. Now here, 
in, on top of the screen at the base is going to be the plugin. So that's going to be right there. So it should start up and you kind of hear the fan whirring that just the fan kicks on every time it's plugged in. It's just to make sure that if it's heated, it's going to cool it and that there shouldn't be any issues. And we have power. Awesome. So the first thing that we kind of want to take a look at, the first troubleshooting step is Kira. Now we went through Kira, we finished it, we know our settings are good, and we know that model was done well. So we shouldn't have to worry about that. But if you do have a print that fails, the first thing would be to check is the student's file, the decode file, or what happened to it in that computer program area. Because that's the first mistake that can really happen. So we're, we're comfortable with that. We went through that just now, so let's not cover it again. But we're going to move on to the second troubleshooting step, and that's going to be mechanical inspection. So we're going to inspect a couple things on the printer. I'm going to get you a little bit more used to it, and then you can kind of make sure everything's plugged in. So first off, I want to show you is called the extruder assembly. So that rides on this big bar here. So this right here where the fan is and where this tubing is going into, is considered the extruder assembly. What it means is that it takes the plastic through this tube and it heats it up right down here in this area on the inside, and then it squirts it out as liquid plastic. And so included with the extruder assembly is going to be this back trigger here. So you'll notice that there is a trigger here in the back, and this is where your filament will feed from. So that's just the motor that pushes the plastic. So it's a little bit further away from the melting end, which is good, it helps us. And so I just want to make you aware of what that was. So here we have our extruder assembly. So I'll probably use that word often, that's why I like to tell you. And we're going to have our x-axis bar, which is this main one right here. Our y-axis is going to be the build plate as it moves back and forth. And then finally, our z-axis is found by looking at the big spiral in the back. So that's just going to be drove up and down. Cool. Okay. Let's take a look at the four motors and three limit switches. So the limit switches are going to tell the printer when to stop moving this direction and this direction. So if you look out here on the inside, you should be able to see a small switch. Okay. That switch is going to tell when to stop moving and where home or zero is. So that's going to be true for all limit switches. It's going to tell the printer that's zero at that mark. And so that's the first one. So if we kind of rotate this, I'm rotating it to the right to look at the left side of the printer. This is going to be the plug-in for our limit switch. You should see it right inside of here. It should say X. Right in between the standoffs where the belt runs. And then next we're going to have our X motor, so we want to make sure that's plugged in as well. So these are decently easy to unplug, so I simply just kind of pull them out and reinsert them. So they are being, they are capable of being unplugged just in passing by it, um, but luckily they're easy to replace and put back in. So that's our X motor, that's going to drive this belt back and forth for this to ride on. So I'm going to rotate it more to the back so we can look at the very back. Next, we're going to have the E motor. And so this is the one that I told you drove the plastic. It should be plugged in here in the back and should have a letter called E on it. That's our extruder motor. And if we look directly south of it, we're going to see the Z motor, which is going to drive the spiral that we looked at. And then directly to the left of the Z motor is going to be our Y and our Y motor. So these two back here. So the only limit switch that we haven't found yet is our Z limit switch, and that's back here on the front of the printer. So I'm gonna raise this up. All I'm doing here is I'm holding this a little bit, and then I'm turning the spiral in the back to the right. Now it might get a little bit of grease on your hands, so be careful, just to keep it you in mind. So I'm gonna raise this up, and I'm gonna show you the last limit switches right inside here. Okay, 
And so that's when it's going to tell it when to stop going down, which is a crucial part. So we kind of did the mechanical inspection. Everything looks like it's running. Everything kind of is moving back and forth well. It doesn't seem to be catching on anything. So we should be good in that term. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do pretty much the hardest step in the training, which is leveling the build plane. And this is a troubleshooting step that causes just about 90% of all issues that we see. Now, we respond to all the tech support requests from all the schools that we're in. We're in roughly 320 at this point. And all of those tech requests do involve quite a few that are leveling. So we like to go over this process pretty well. So I'm going to show you two things that we can talk about, and I'm going to use those words often. So I may have already mentioned that we have a nozzle on this, but I want to show you where the nozzle actually is. And so if I kind of lift this up, you'll notice right underneath here that there is a nozzle with plastic that may be on it or otherwise, and this is where our extruded plastic is going to go. So I have a little bit of plastic still sitting on mine. I can clear that off when we heat it up. So how much time do you have left, Eddie? Uh, about five or ten minutes. Okay, so I'll try and be a little bit quick about this. We do have videos about all of this on our website for you to follow if you feel uncomfortable about it at any point. So I'll make sure to link those in on our follow-up email. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I saw the nozzle, and we're going to want to level that nozzle 200 microns away from this build plate. So we wanted to have a very small gap so that when the plastic comes out, it comes out at like a horizontal. So it's going to lay it perfectly down and it's going to stick. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a piece of paper, if you have one nearby. We can fold that blank piece of paper. We can just fold it in half. Hamburger style works well. I'm gonna clip the last of my filament off. Add a nice clean nozzle. And what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of start the process of moving the printer. So I'm going to click on the button once. And I'm going to go to setup and then auto home. So click setup, click auto home. And that's going to move our printer to all of those limit switches. It's going to reach the origin point. So it's going to go 0x, 0y, and 0z. And that's basically where it goes to every time before it starts printing. So the reason we did the auto home is that we want to have 0z so we can level this build plate to the nozzle we just looked at. Because we want that gap to be real nice. So one thing that happens after you auto home, it locks all the motors for its own safety. So in order to move these around again, because we will want to move the X and Y, what we're going to do is we're going to click on the button one more time. This time go to setup again, and then disable motors. And that's going to allow us to move our build plate and our extruder assembly again. Okay. It's, it's locked prior. All right, so what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you one other thing before we put the paper in between. And so I'm gonna tilt it kind of the side here to let you see. And you'll notice that there is a spring and a knob here. And so this spring and knob is what helps us move the bill plate up and down. So if I turn the knob righty tighty, it's going to lower the build area. So let's go ahead and put that paper in between. So I'm going to take my piece of paper and I'm going to put it in between the nozzle and the build area. So if you'll notice I'm having trouble sticking it in between, if that's true, you can push down on the build plate because it's riding on those springs that we just saw. So I'm going to push down and then slide the paper underneath. So now I have the paper underneath and what we're going to do is we're going to line it up with each of those three knobs. So the hardest one is here on the inside. And so I'm gonna line the nozzle up like so. So you'll notice that I have a spring underneath here and then the nozzle directly above it. So that's a little hard to see there, but it's right there. 
And that's going to allow us to measure that point for the distance. Okay, so then I'm going to put the paper in between. So now because it's easier to see without it. And we're going to check how it feels. So does it feel like there's resistance or does it feel tight or does it feel loose? Uh, it's a little loose. Okay, so if it feels loose, then we're going to turn it to the left just a little bit, so maybe a quarter turn to raise it up until we feel a resistance. It's almost going to feel like the paper's dragging against that nozzle, and that's going to be a good height for it. So we want to have a little drag, a little bit of resistance on the paper. So kind of adjust that knob reach in here and turn it to the left just a little bit until you get the feel that you enjoy. So it's kind of just a, you know, learn as you go process, just as long as you get it very near, it should do well. So it should have some resistance. If you're having trouble reaching into it, one thing you can do is you can pull the build plate out, adjust the knob, and then push it back in. Kind of make it to where that resistance feels pretty nice. So I'm going to make mine just a little bit taller too. It should almost feel like the paper's kind of like vibrating in a way when you move it past the nozzle. Let me know how you do it. All right. You feel comfortable with it? Not a lot of resistance. Okay. If you have a lot of resistance, if it feels like you can't move it or it's like buckling the paper, that is too much. And then you're just going to turn it to the right. So it's going to go this direction. And that will lower it. Now, I did pick the hardest one first, so sometimes it is easier to try and level this outside one to get used to it and then come back. All right. So a lot of the time it's small turns, like quarter turns should help you kind of adjust it to the height you want to be. Otherwise it'll overdo it very fast. So you probably have that one pretty close. So let's try this outside one now because it's so much easier to reach for our hands. And we'll kind of get that adjustment in and dial that in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull that extruder. We're gonna pull it out here to the side and then move the Y axis back just a little bit and line up the two. So I'm gonna move the camera, pardon the shakiness to show you. I'm going to line them up again like that. That should be right where I want it. And then, of course, use the paper in between the two to check the distance. So mine still has a pretty good resistance. Now, I'm going to actually make it a little bit lower because it has too much for me. So I'm going to just twist it this direction, and it should lower the flight. I went too far. All right, there we are. So counterclockwise is going to be down and clockwise is going to be up. So clock up, count down. It's a good way I like it. You all right? I've 
had a small mechanical issue here. Did one of the uh, gears pop or one of the adjustment knobs pop off? It did. <clears throat> so that would mean it went all the way to the left. And so it's going to be very, very close now, and it's going to be too tight to move that paper. So the way you put it back on is going to be the way to lower the build plate. My fingers would cooperate. Yeah, it's starting to get cold outside. Our fingers stop working. That's how I always feel. And it would have to be the one that's hard to reach. This inside one? So try pulling the build plate all the way out. Is it all the way forward like this? Mm -hmm. Almost got it. So one way that can also help is if you push down on the build area, it makes it much easier to place it on. So if I had it and I pushed down on this like so, it's going to give me an extra room to tighten and loosen it. I keep pushing it off the end of the thread. So if it's kind of at the end of its threads and you're having trouble threading it on, try pushing down to make the threads come out further. I am. Okay. All right, back in the game. All right. Now the end. All right. Next up. All right, so next one's gonna be this one on here on the outside. Okay. We're gonna do the exact same thing. We're just gonna test that paper underneath it, make sure that we can feel the drag or resistance. So mine's too low. So I can't feel anything, it feels very loose. So I'm gonna twist it to the left until I feel it kind of bite into the paper and feel that drag. Okay. Feel comfortable on that one? Yes. That was much easier. Finally, we're going to have our one back here. So we're going to level a triangle, essentially. We're going to have one kind of here in the middle of the build plate back here. Okay. And it's also on the outside, so it's easier to reach. 
we're going to do the same thing, kind of get that same resistance all the way around, which means we should have the same gap all the way around. All right. Awesome. So I know we're pretty much out of time. I know you're probably needing to go pretty soon. Um, the last thing that we really need to talk about is just loading the filament in and taking the print. So I am more than happy to stay with you as long as you would like me to. Keep going. Awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on the button. We're going to go down to Setup. We're going to click Preheat PLA. So you'll notice there's also another preheat. It says preheat soft pool. Okay. Click preheat soft pool. That, uh, in the manual. Sorry? I, I read about that one in the manual. Fantastic. So that is a great thing to do for unloading filament, for taking anything out, for clearing clogs. It's excellent. Um, it's pretty much our recommended way of unloading and also trying to pull out anything of the nozzle before any sort of disassembly of the printer. Okay. So what we're gonna do is now it's heating up, so I'm gonna move this x-axis up so it doesn't hurt our build area because the nozzle can burn little marks into this. So click on the button. We're gonna do it a different way. We're gonna click and go to controls. And at the bottom of the control menu, we're gonna have something called move axis. We're gonna click on move axis and move one millimeter. And then finally move Z. And then we're gonna turn that up to about 20, 25 should be good. And it should raise our printer by itself. That's gonna be more of the mechanical way to do it. And then to get back to the other screens, we can either let the screen time out or we can just click on the button to go all the way back through the menus. So it's now it's at a safe point and it's not gonna burn our bill plate. And then we can also load filament in and see that filament coming out. So mine's right at about 200, 210 degrees, so it's ready to load. So I'm gonna take that piece of filament that I have in my spool. And it's just gonna sit in it with that crossbar. And I'm going to unspool it from the side or where it's kept. So keeping it in the side here helps a whole bunch. It's going to make sure it doesn't tangle up or mess up in any way. But whenever you feed it into the printer, you do want to pull it out of that area. I mess my up here. So I'm going to pull that out like so. Now mine has a bit of a funny end, so I'm going to clip that because it's not going to going to feed in well. So in your toolkit, you should have a pack of flush shears. We're just going to clip it at an angle, makes it much easier to feed through. Okay. Finally, we're going to unrotate this to the right, and that yellow trigger I had showed it kind of towards the beginning of troubleshooting. I'm going to squeeze that trigger and place it through that small hole here next to the Z axis. And we're going to push it all the way through the white tubing. And if it doesn't go into the white tubing and you feel like it's not quite there, sometimes twisting it around into a different direction will help, or clipping it to a different direction will help. If you get it through the tube, just push it all the way through until you feel kind of the hit of resistance, and then push a little bit extra so that we melt some plastic and push it out the nozzle. And that's going to let us clear colors. It's going to make sure that our nozzle is primed and has pressure. Okay. And now if you take a look at your nozzle, you should be able to see that it has kind of like a glob of plastic on near it. Is that true for you? If you don't quite see plastic yet, yeah, just push a little bit more. There probably is going to be a different color than your, than your plastic that you fed through because we test these before we send them out. Okay, I've gone as far as it'll let me. Okay, and then just try and push a little bit more. It's gonna be very tight, but 
should slowly feed through, and that's just it melting down. If it feels like it's at a very hard stop, it's probably not quite there yet. Hmm. So did you see it go through the tube? It's through the tube into the extruder. Okay. But no plastic yet. No plastic yet. All right. Try a little bit more pressure then. See if it. Okay. Is the temperature at 220 for it? Hang on, let me raise the, the Z axis and see what I've got. Okay. Bring it up high. I can see underneath it. How do I tell the temperature of the uh, extruder nozzle? So here on the screen, you should be able to see the nozzle right here in the top right hand corner. Okay. I have a top value, which what it wants to heat to, and the bottom value is what it's at. Oh, uh, we're not even warmed up yet. Oh, what temperature is it at? Uh, top number is at zero, the bottom is at 24. Okay, so we need to preheat PLA again. So that would make sense. So if it's at, if it says zero at the top, it means it's on cool down and it's just trying to stay cool. So go back to setup and click preheat PLA one more time. And then you should see that top value change to 220. There we go. <clears throat> awesome. That thing's heating quick too. Yeah, it heats up in about a minute, minute and a half usually. It's, it's decently quick. Celsius. The only piece that is going to be hot is that nozzle and heating block underneath here. So you have to make an effort to actually touch it. This entire shield fan is cool to the touch or at least just slightly, there shouldn't be any problems with students touching it. Wow. Okay. So we probably have that plastic build up now, so we should be able to push it out once it kind of reaches that temperature and it should be a lot easier this time. Oh yeah, here we go. Sweet. That makes a big difference if it's heated or not. <laughs> Usually, yeah. All right, so plastic came out, looks good. Looks good. Sweet, we can clear that plastic off with a tool. Just kind of nab at it and pull it, peel it off. What we're gonna do now is we're going to start our print. So the first thing we're going to look at when we start our print is that first layer. We want to make sure that first layer sticks. It's going to tell us if the model is going to complete or not. So okay. it's kind of stringing and it isn't sticking. It's too far away. If you don't see any coming out, but it is at the build plate, it's too close. All right. Okay. So go ahead and click on the button and go to print from SD card. So click one time, go down to print from SD. And then we're going to choose that same file that we slice. So yours may say robot, ultimate or robot. We can just click on that file. All right, we have moved. What it's going to do is it's going to heat up first, but it's already heated, so it should be quick. Then it's going to move to origin point, and then finally it'll move to the middle to start printing. 
So let me know how yours goes. Mine's gonna kind of start right now and it's gonna move from this point and touch down and purge, and then it will start in the middle. Mine's in motion. Awesome. So we just wanna watch that first layer of plastic lay down, make sure the nozzle is actually putting plastic on the build area. So mine's a bit far away, it's not sticking, so I'm gonna move it up while it's printing. Just a little bit. Until I, each one the same amount though. I change each one the same amount to make sure that the whole build plate just moves up. A little bit far away, it's, it's good now. It's actually laying plastic down, but that's the easiest way to adjust it. Is while it's printing, you can adjust those knobs, just very small amount of turns, because we have it really close, and it should make it stick. It's sticking. It is? Uh -huh. Fantastic. Do you like the look of it? Does it look nice? Seem like everything's sticking down well. Yeah. Well, that's it then. We finished. Cool. Excellent. Do you have any questions for me, Eddie? Uh, when this thing prints <clears throat> and it finishes a print, it'll automatically clear itself cool off. out. Cool so off. It, it's going to automatically cool down, yes. So what it's going to do is it, when it finishes printing, it's going to take this, it's going to move off to the side, and it's going to cool off, and it's going to go to zero. Okay. Screen will stay on, and the fan will stay on, but that's all that's going to be on. The fail-safe for these printers is simply to unplug them. Unplugging them is never going to hurt it. It's always going to be just fine, and that's if something's going crazy, that's the easiest way to turn it off. All right, so that covers just about everything. I think um, the soft pulls is gonna make sure that you don't have any clogs, because you did read that about it. Now, if you do, there is a small nozzle or a small little uh, needle in your toolkit. That is for crossing the nozzle if necessary. Um, usually you don't have to use it, the soft pulls do the job. Okay. Good deal. Awesome. There's a little bottom of mine. Looks pretty good. Turned out just fine. Dice stuck down well. Yeah. Well, Eddie, you've been an excellent student. You Thank you. This and breeze through it. It's been great. Now, if you don't have any more questions, then I'm going to take my leave here. Um, I will send you a follow-up email that includes this video. It's going to have a couple different links. Um, everything is available on our support. It's just nwa3d.com slash support. We should have videos available for you if you forget any of this. And then we also have a couple of different troubleshooting and those uh, programs that I told you about earlier are also on there. So if nothing else, I very much appreciate your time and I hope everything goes well and you have some good luck 3D printing. Thank you very much. Of course, if you ever need support, just go to that support page and click on the request support. It makes you fill out a Google form. You or your students can do it. We respond to both, and then we link you into it if it's a student, all right? Okay. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate it. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. No problem.